The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter, on this second Sunday after the Epiphany. On the third day, there was a wedding in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the jars there, for the jars holding twenty or thirty gallons. Up to the brim, and he said, take it to the master of the. So they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water, now began, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when they have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have, you have kept the good wine until now. Thus the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your friends, our Lord Jesus Christ in this text says one or two things that allow us to know that this is an epiphany text. First, we have what Jesus says to his mother, what Jesus' mother says to him, or what he says to his mother. And then also we have a parenthetical line right here, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then finally, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And then this part, and his disciples believed in him. We get too bogged down nowadays if we even remember the epiphany instead of just the holiday that comes after Christmas when Christmas fatigue has overcome us, when Christmas fatigue has allowed us to forget all about epiphany because What's the big deal, right? I mean, we've had wise men in our nativity scenes since nativity scenes existed. So we have no real understanding of epiphany. Not when it comes to the Christmas season and then epiphany and as we move forward into Lent. However, we should remember that the star in the sky over Bethlehem was the gospel to the Gentiles. It was the way that pointed them to the cross or the Christ who would be And so the Gentiles, the Magi, walked and rode all the way following the star which is the gospel for them to where they find the gospel incarnate. And then they worshipped the king of kings. And now we're all good with that because it's not too far away from Christmas. And as I said, it's been part of our nativity scene forever. So we're okay with that one. And we understand that it's an epiphany, that the star was the epiphany for the Magi and that the epiphany pointed to Christ. So we can understand how the star would be the epiphany leading us to Christ. And the fact of the matter is, is that all epiphanies point to Jesus as the Messiah. If, the, if an epiphany comes and it, does not, uh, and it does not point to Christ as the Messiah, then the epiphany is not actually an epiphany. It's sinful fleshly opinion. And we all know that we've had plenty of that. Too much, too often. 
And so in our text today, we find an epiphany that is, is actually laid out for us even better than the star of David. And yet, we seem to forget about this text in the, in the second Sunday of Epiphany. Because it doesn't shine brightly as a star, and yet has a messianic understanding and meaning more than the previous. Here we have Christ. Well, let me make this connection as well. During Christmas, Facebook lights up, Twitter lights up, all of the social media, as long as you haven't been canceled on it, lights up with the question, Mary, did you know? And of course, many a snarky Lutheran answers, of course Mary knew, Gabriel told her. But I don't think that we understand that little snarky remark well enough. Of course Mary knew because Gabriel told her. What's the big deal? Well, what about Mary's own faith? What about the things that she pondered in her heart? And as she pondered, this was the confession that she herself made. Yes, she knew, but she actually put her knowledge into action and to say this. To point to her, to point to her son who was the Christ and say to him, to, to, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time, my hour has not yet come. So there was a communication there between the two of them that they both knew or they both had had an epiphany that Christ himself is the Messiah. And so the epiphany for Mary is that she, her son is the Christ. And Christ has an epiphany because his mother says this, do whatever he tells you. And then here's the neat thing. His mother says to him, they have no more wine. Then Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? And then she looks, she doesn't even answer Jesus. She turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. And what does Jesus do? He obeys his mother. He takes six stone water jars that were filled to the brim for the Jewish rites of purification. And that we cannot overlook. That, he, that the stone water jars were set apart for the, for the Jewish rites of purification. That they would be purified. And then he turns the water into wine. Of course, it cannot be overstated that the purification jars turning into wine is directly an altar sacrificial understanding of the Eucharist. Where Christ gives us His body and blood and there we are so purified. And so that cannot be overlooked. And yet we, we will keep going and come back. Jesus tells them to fill the jars with water and some of them, and now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast, the one who would give approval for the wine. Whether or not it was good was really up to the master of the feast. And so, when in transition from Christ to the master of the feast, there was a disconnect. The master of the feast did not know that what Christ had done. All that he knew, all that he knew was that the wine was also. All that he knew was that the wine was the epitome of the greatest wine of all time. And yet in that transition, there are servants. And those servants, those servants who took the, the, the stone jars from Christ after seeing what he did to the master of the feast, that transition is much like the transition of the Magi by the star to Bethlehem. In other words, as the servants took the water now turned wine to the master of the feast, they had an epiphany. An epiphany is this. 
always, always, always an epiphany is this, that it points to Christ as the Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the one who John says will take away the sin of the world. And so, that wine that traveled from Christ to the Master of the Feast reminds us that we too feast. We feast on the foretaste to come here at the altar, and we will feast in the true, and we will eat at the true feast in heaven itself. We, poor miserable sinners, are the ones carrying the wine. We pastors are the ones who carry the wine from Christ to the people at the feast. As a friend of mine once said, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. There is the ministry. There is Christ Himself who gives Himself over for us. And we can see how thoroughly that epiphany was that St. John didn't want us to miss the point. It seems like it would be obvious, for as I pointed out, that the wine going from servant to, to master of the feast was likened to the Magi following the star to Christ the, and, and the epiphany that pointed to Christ. But just to make sure that we get it through our thick skulls, John says this, When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and he did not know where it came from. That's important. He didn't know. All that he knew, all that he knew was that the wine was awesome. And also that he had drank pretty deeply. So I'm going to reread that. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and he did not know where it came from. And here's the parenthetical comment. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Those servants carried the star of David, as it were. They carried the, the wine, the true, and, the true and understandable sign that Christ is the Messiah. And their lives changed forever. For they, were, they had become witnesses to Christ, just as Simeon had been earlier. They knew. Jesus was and Jesus is the Messiah. And we'll reread. When the master of the feast tasted the wine, or the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Dear Christian friends, this is also true for us. It's also true for us that all of the wine that we may drink may taste good. There is no wine that edifies the soul like the wine turned to the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, nothing edifies us or better than that good wine. And I can tell you this with absolute certainty. The good wine that we partake here at the altar is the same good wine that our family, friends, and those who have gone before us partake. The good wine shall be served in the liturgy. The good wine shall be served by the pastor to shut in. The good wine shall be given in abundance to all Christian men and women who rejoice. In case you didn't get it again, St. John gives us a third or fourth descriptor. This, the first of his signs, 
Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And in this last one, in this last one, we have the epitome of what it means to have an epiphany. Just like the wise men, just like the magi, and just as we will look throughout our Sundays in the church here, particularly when we get to the parables, we will see that all of them have epiphanies in them. But in this one, just so we get it, John writes and says, and his disciples believed in him. And if his disciples believed in him, then so do we. They did not believe in him until the good wine, but they believed in him until or the, after they received the Christ wine. His disciples believed in him. It was then that they knew that Christ was truly the Messiah. And from John 2 to John 6, many of them would continue to follow believing that Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, having seen all of the epiphanies. And then John 6, you will see many disciples flee. And what do they flee in regards to when Christ says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. The connection between John 2 and John 6 is staggering. In John 2, everyone was really excited about the good wine. But many could not bear to, to hear of the good blood and the good body. And to those who remained the remnant, he fed his body and his blood for the forgiveness of their sins and to the salvation of their soul. So likewise we do here at Augustine and Evangelical Lutheran Church. So likewise we do here. We are the remnant. And the remnant is fed sacramentally in every way that is good for both body and soul. How much I love being the pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church. Because I get to see daily the remnant, those who are not afraid to call on Christ on the altar and say, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of my enemies. In all of those things, we can say, we eat and we drink the true Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We believe and we do not leave. We do not flee, but instead we bite upon the flesh of Christ and drink deeply on his blood because we Gentiles have seen the star we have carried the wine turned into water and we shall go with him even unto death death upon a cross after that we shall hear he is risen he is risen indeed Alleluia and then Christ will ascend, will descend into hell, ascend into the heavens, and give us the promise in holy baptism that we too shall be called disciples of Christ. We too will be given the mandate to go and baptize and teach. And so his pastors will do so, and the disciples will grow, and they will make a good confession. And in this good confession, we have come to know and believe and to speak that Jesus did all these things at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory. And we disciples believe in him. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.